The message this morning follows, follows the same path. It's entitled Temptation, Trouble, and Joy. Now, that doesn't make any sense, does it? Temptation, trouble, and joy. You know, it's been said that an airplane pilot flying in a storm or in the darkness of the night can become disoriented. And even though it seems like they're flying straight ahead, they're flying in circles. Their natural sense, senses are telling them they're okay, and yet they're not okay. In order to keep flying safely to their destination, they have to, res they have to rely on some material things. An instrument panel that tells them where they are, what direction they're going into them, what altitude they're at, the gas consumption, everything about that plane to get the people safely to where they're going. In our lives, we have to rely on an instrument panel as well, a spiritual one, that tells us what we're truly going on, what's going on in our lives, no matter how we feel, no matter how we think, or even imagine. Hallelujah. Sometimes what's true from the neck up is not, doesn't make sense to our heart, does it? And as believers in Christ Jesus, we can be assured that we have an instrument panel that will always keep us on the right course. Amen? Are you awake? Uh, we're going to wake you up this morning. No matter what the situation, no matter how much pain you're going through, no matter the circumstances or the temptation, God has given us the tools to stay on course. Hallelujah. Our text is found in the book of Psalms, the 119th Psalm, the 105th verse. As you find it in your Bible, would you stand with me as we honor the word of God? Psalm 119, verse 105. Thy word, God's word, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The Lord bless the reading of his word and bless his servant as he brings it forth. You may be seated. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet. What does that mean? It means you can see where you are. Hmm? Sometimes in life, we don't know where we are. We don't know where we're going. But the Word of God tells us where we are. It reveals to us not only our strengths, but maybe even our weaknesses. And then it says it's a light unto our path. It means that as we move forward, we can see where we're going. Hello? We can see where we're going. Most people in this world are spinning around. They have no way. They don't know where they are. They don't know where they're going. They, don't, they have no idea where they came from. How many people do you know, they, they get up in the morning after a night of frivolity and don't remember where they were, who they were with, and what they even did? That's supposed to be fun? Not in my book. Hmm? The Bible tells us in John 16 and 13, also we have other things, other tools that God has given us. It says, how be it, when he, the Holy Spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you in all truth. He will show you things to come. The Holy Spirit is a guide, a teacher. A guide is someone that doesn't stay behind and say, okay, go over there and go over there. No, he goes ahead of us and lets us know if the path is safe, if it's the right direction and the right road. We have the word of God. And we have the Spirit of God dwelling in us. Hallelujah. If you have not figured out already, even believers go through problems. Some people think when they come to Christ, they're going to be in Shangri-La. It doesn't work that way. Not yet, anyway. We'll get to the great, great place in heaven. But we go through problems. We go through trials. We go through sickness. We even go through temptations. Mm -hmm. Not you, I know. The devil just checked you off for one. Listen to the book of James written by the, the stepbrother of Jesus. James who comes to Christ after the cross. Becomes the head of the early church in Jerusalem. James, the first chapter, the second and third verse says, My brethren, count it all joy, joy, when ye fall into various temptations. Diverse temptation in the King James. Knowing this, that the trying or testing of your faith works or develops patience. 
Wow. How can you be joyful when you have all these issues in your life? Oh, my God. Remember, Jesus tests us and Satan tempts us. Hmm? A test and a temptation, totally different things. Jesus tests us so that we become stronger. I know our illustrious Department of Education and our politicians want to do away with testing because it makes everybody look bad, right? I have met people with a high school diploma that can't even write a sentence that makes any sense. They warehouse these people through school and they expect them to get a job. I don't know where. A test tells the teacher, the instructor, what the person has learned. Hmm? And if, if it turns out that they fail the test, then it means either the instructor or they are not doing their job. Amen? So don't be afraid of tests because God is there for us. The point here is that the testing of our faith produces endurance and strength, even greater faith in God when we're tested. We move to another level when we're successful. If we truly understand this as a believer in Jesus Christ, we can be joyful in spite of how we feel. I know you're going through problems. We get the prayer requests every day. And the ones that we don't see are really problems, aren't they? We don't even want to tell anybody about it. But God is there for us. Listen carefully. Even Paul in 2 Corinthians 7, 4 says, I am exceedingly joyful in all our tribulation. Paul, you need to go see a psychiatrist. Why would he say that? Again, in Romans 5, 3. And not only so, but we glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation worketh patience and patience experience and experience hope. One of the things about being tested is when you're successful and you see what God is doing in your life and how he got you through, you can look back and say, you know, he did it before, he'll do it again. Amen? Hallelujah. In 1 Corinthians 13, there's a very interesting scripture that we have quoted, memorized, but what does it really mean? The first part of it tells us that there is no temptation taken you or seized you except what is common to man. There's nothing new in the playbook. The devil keeps using the same things. Even on Jesus he did. And most of the time we unfortunately equate temptation with sin. The temptation is a test. What you do with it can become sin. Amen? All right. I know you don't get tempted. You never sin, right? <laughs> temptation is a test. And again... Once we overcome, we become victorious. Jesus, as a man, was tempted in every way, it says. Every way. Every type of temptation that you can think of, as we are. But he does not sin. He is our example. Most of us can easily say, I can't help myself. Hmm? When I was in Bible college, they had a song. It wasn't really religious. It said, Satan, get behind me and push. Not exactly the right thing to say. Huh? Hmm. Scripture tells us that every person, not just you, is going to be tested, is going to be tempted. That's the good news and the bad news. There were others tempted before you in the same way, and there will be others who will be tempted after us in the same way. But how do I overcome? We use that word. We sing about overcoming. We had a song we sang earlier. If you're suffering with temptation to sin, ask the Holy Spirit to give you the strength to overcome. And that sounds very simplistic, but it's very true. Also, if you can, find a believer who has struggled with the same problem. That's what CR is really all about. Finding someone that can say, I know what you're going through. I've been there. You'll notice in all of the programs, even with addictions, people who have never taken drugs can very rarely help someone who's on drugs. 
We can give you the scientific. We can give you the diagnostic. But they can say to you, you don't know what you're talking about. You haven't been there. You haven't been there. We can find someone who's been there and sex is successfully overcome. That's the person we'll listen to. We have the Holy Spirit working with us, and we have people that can work with us. Someone who's struggled and come through victoriously because of the grace and the glory and the power of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we have overcomers. It's a 12-step program, very simple program. But every one of those steps is powerful, leading to overcoming. This Celebrate Recovery Program, the same way. Sometimes we think the only problems are drugs and alcohol, and we know that's not true. What causes a person to go to that extreme? That's the problem. What causes it, and what's keeping it going? You see, when you can overcome temptation, when you can overcome sin, you can help other people. You can help them. I understand what you're going through. Let's talk about it. I've been there. Oh, hallelujah. This verse in 2 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 13 goes on to say, and God is faithful. What does that mean? When God says something, he keeps his word every time. He doesn't lie. That's the one thing he can't do. But when he says he's going to do something, he will do it. Hallelujah. He will not let you be tempted, the word says, beyond what you can bear. Wow. You can't stop the temptation. But God can stop it if he knows you can't handle it. Amen? Look at the story of Job, right? What does the devil himself say about Job? I can't get to him. You've put a hedge around him and his family and his possessions. Hmm. Wow. You see, most of us never get it. That's why we stay in the problem. God wants us to overcome it, to move on, to be a new creation in Christ Jesus. This statement tells us clearly that God knows us. He knows you and me. He knows our strengths, he knows our weaknesses, he understands us, and he understands the limits that we can handle in life. Hmm? He understands that. Hmm? The bottom line is if God permits trouble, temptation to come our way, we can handle it. Oh, you didn't get it. He won't allow it if you can't handle it. Look in the word of God. You'll see examples of this. God put his hand and stopped different things when he knew that people couldn't handle it. But then there were people that went through great things because God already knew that they could handle it. Hmm? Now, we're not talking about things that we do and then call it a temptation. Hmm? If we cause it, it's our problem. And the good news is even then God will help you. But when it's coming in from the devil, God will hold it back when he knows you can't handle it. Years ago, we, had a, we have a sister church in Coney Island. And I remember we used to have dual meetings. We would go there, and they would come to ours. And I remember an older man, he was in his 80s at the time, sharing a testimony. And he shared it because he knew that somebody was there and needed to hear it. He was a man, you know this guy at work, he was a Casanova. He would brag about his conquests, all his girlfriends, and all these people that he would have sex with. Excuse me if I offend you. And the men and women that worked with him, they waited every Monday to hear about the new adventure. Hmm? But somebody, somebody, some Christian person saw something in this man, and invited him to church. And he came to know Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior. Hmm? Now he's a new Christian. You think the devil's going to let him go? Oh, he wants you back. He's invested in you. Anyway, the men and women that he worked with, they were shocked. 
Why, that, that was their whole goal in life, to find out and live their life through him. And now he's talking all this religious stuff. He must have gone crazy. So they decided to cure him. His boss was involved. They sent him down to the basement of this factory to get some supplies. And they locked him in the room by himself, he thought. But in the room was a beautiful young lady that they had purchased to restart him. And imagine this, gentlemen, going into a room and a beautiful young woman, naked, says to you, anything you want, I'm here for you. I'll say amen for you. What would you do? You can't get out. And here is a gift. Some people might say, God bless. What would you do? He was shaken all over. And he knew he had a weakness. But he had come to Christ. He started to pray. And as he prayed, this young lady began to cry. I mean, really cry. All his friends were sitting outside the room waiting for certain sounds. And they hear the woman crying. They said, oh, my God, what did he do to this woman? They open the door, and they find the woman kneeling naked. And this man has his hand on her head praying over her. See, she was somebody's daughter that had taken a wrong turn in life, and they were probably praying for her. What I'm trying to say to you is God knew that this man could handle this, even though he was a new Christian, and he let it happen so that he could become strong and that young lady could come to Christ. We had another young, uh, not a young man, an older man in our church. I love this testimony because I could identify with parts of it. He was that little guy, a tough guy. He was in the Marines, spent more time in the brig than he did out of it. Tough guy from Brooklyn. He got married to a lovely woman. He was religious in the fact that when he was a baby, they baptized him. So he figured that was it. He didn't need to go to church anymore. One day his wife happened to go into the door of a church and gave her heart to Christ. She came home to tell him the good news. He beat her up. How dare you do that without my permission? You don't need to go to that church. And she kept going. He got so angry one day that he, had, he tried everything to keep his wife from going to church. He went out in the backyard of his house, and this is what he said to God. God, if you're real, make me cry. Never in his life had he ever cried. Never. Some of you men understand that. We think crying is a weakness. I've seen cops cry. I've seen soldiers cry. I've seen doctors cry. You know what happened to him? He started to weep. Couldn't stop. And to the day he died, I was proud to do his funeral. That man cried. If you said, Jesus, ooh! But you know what? He would go and visit people. He'd share the gospel with everybody he met. He never, never went back to the man he was after he met the Lord. See, God knows something about you and me. He knows something about people out there. He knows their potential. He knows what they're capable of in the kingdom of God. But somebody's got to tell them and point them in the right direction. That's our job. We don't save them. We just point them to the way. The one who, ha who has all the answers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. How about this? We may be bent. But with God, we will not be broken. We will not be defeated. And we will not be destroyed. Hmm. God will keep us. 
He'll hold us up. Hallelujah. He'll keep us from things and people and circumstances that would crush us. He does. He lets you know. We also see in the same scripture that there's supernatural options that God gives us. He has special options available to each of us for delivering us and protecting us from trouble. Hmm? Look what it says here. But when you are tempted, notice it doesn't say if. It says when you are tempted. When you are tempted, he, God, will also provide a way of escape. A way out so that we will be able to bear it, to stand up under it, to be stronger because of it. Hmm? Doesn't Paul teach us the same principle in Ephesians 6, 11, when he talks about the armor of God, all the various pieces as he's looking at the Roman soldiers that are guarding him under house arrest? He sees each piece of the armor as a spiritual thing. Helmet of salvation and so on. The sword of the spirit. All these things. But look what he says in the beginning. Put on the whole armor of God. You can't leave a piece off. That you may be able to stand against the wiles or the tricks or the temptations of the devil. If you've ever been in a fight, I know you've never been in a fight, right? If you fall down, you get hurt. The idea is to keep standing. And here Paul, who came from, the, uh, from Tarsus, which was a, a town that had a huge stadium, and they had all these sporting events, and you could see how it affects his writing. We wrestle not against principalities, right? He talks about having done all to stand. How many times have you been standing in spite of everything that happened to you? I have met saints of God that are horizontal on a hospital bed. They're standing. In the spirit. Hallelujah. How in the world can you do that when you're in pain, when you're going through suffering, when you're going through all kinds of trouble? And yet God expects you to keep standing. Hallelujah. Look at Peter in 2 Peter 3, 9. The Lord knows how to rescue or deliver the godly out of temptations. We may not know, but he knows. He knows. And he'll intervene. What this means to us as the children of God is that when we're in trouble, when we're tempted, when we're tested, it may feel like we're in a locked room. No way out. No windows. No doors that open. Right? No way of escape. How many know what I'm talking about? Well, if you don't, you will. No way of escape. What are you going to do? There are so many examples in the Bible of this type of situation. Look at the Israelites back in the book of Exodus. Two and a half million plus women, women, men, children. They had escaped from Egypt, from slavery. And now they're going to the promised land, right? I don't know what they were singing, but they were probably happy until they found out that the Egyptian army, the Pharaoh decided he wanted them back. He let them go and now he wanted them back. And I'm sure he would have executed all the leaders. The Egyptian army is racing toward them. And only the pillar of fire of God is holding them back. Trapped. Men, women, and children. Between the army of Pharaoh and the Red Sea. No way out. Now, look what they cry out to God. It would have been be better for us to serve the Egyptians as slaves than to die here in the desert. What an attitude. Hmm? Ever been in a place like that? Want to go back to the old habits, back to the old ways where you felt comfortable? It amazes me how people are comfortable in certain lifestyles. The smell, the look, the devastation it does on them, and they think they're okay. You know what I'm talking about. Hmm? Here, these Israelites thought they were finished. This was the end. But God had a plan to save them that they could never, ever dream of. And that's what I'm trying to get to this morning. Don't try to figure out how God's going to get you out. He will get you out in a way you... Wow! I never even had the audacity to even ask for that. Hmm? That's the way God is. 
Look what happens. God tells Moses, the leader, as another guy, would you have picked him to lead the people out of, it, uh, out of Egypt? Huh? A murderer? Hmm? Couldn't speak? Had a problem speaking? He's not a likely candidate for a debate. Hmm? God picked this man. Later on, for 40 years, these people drive him crazy, complaining about everything. But God knew that Moses was strong enough to hold in, hold on. Now imagine this conversation. You got two and a half million people moaning, groaning, calling your names, throwing sand at you, whatever. Why'd you take us out, right? God says, what do you got in your hand there? Staff, piece of wood. He said, take it and extend it over the Red Sea. What in the world does that mean? What would you do? Say, God, <laughs> I look like a dope. I look like a fool. Hmm? Sometimes God uses the foolish things to show his strength. Moses had to have faith, too. He had learned one thing about God. If God said it, do it. Hmm? Don't argue. Do it. He stretches out his hand and, and this piece of wood and the Red Sea, some seven miles long and, and 30 foot high, opens up. But God said, not only they're going to get through the, through the sea, it's going to be on dry ground. What good is it if you walk into a, the bed of a river or ocean and you sink in the mud? Hmm? They had their wagons. They, had all their, they were carrying all kinds of stuff. They walked through on dry ground. Meanwhile, the Egyptians are trying to get to them. And finally, the cloud, a pillar of fire, lets them go. And here they come. And they figure, hey, if they went through, we can go through. See, your blessing is not their blessing. Hmm? And here they are. Oh, we got them trapped now, right? As the last of the Israelites get out of the sea, out of the, out of the, the seabed, what happens? The same miracle that saved the Israelites, what happened? It eliminated the enemy. Is somebody listening? Hmm? Somebody's driving you crazy? Give them to God. <laughs> You'd be amazed what God can do when someone messes with his children. Amen? Oh, hallelujah. What do you think about Daniel? Successful in another country, in Babylon. Hmm? He had a high position. He's tested. Hmm? All he had to do was kneel down and say a few words to a statue. That's all he had to do. But he didn't do it. He said, I'm not going to do that. He opened the windows of his house so everybody could see him praying, not to the statue, but to the real God. He ends up in the lion's den. Hmm? Did God want to kill him? No. All this happened so that the king could say, your God is real. Your God is the real God. Hmm? Sometimes God takes us through something to prove something to others. We're going to talk about that in a minute. See, your attitude while you're going through your issues, people watch you. Hmm? If you're walking around, oh, God, look what happened to me. Oh, where are you? Instead of saying, God, I don't like where I am, but I know you're going to get me out of it. I know you're going to give me the victory. That's where the joy comes from. The joy comes from knowing that God is going to be there for you. Oh, hallelujah. Look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You think they wanted to go into the fiery furnace? No. Again, they were challenged. Worship this statue and you'll be okay. They said no. I like what they said. To the king, what chutzpah, our God will deliver us from that fiery furnace. Hmm. And if he doesn't, we're still not going to worship the statue. Wow. Now what happened? The people that brought them in, they'll say, the king got mad. He got insulted. Made it seven times hotter. They ate up all the oxygen. Those strong men that brought them to the entrance to the, to the fiery furnace, they dropped dead. And what does the Bible say? These three men were walking around in the fire. Right? 
The only thing that burnt was the things that held them. Oh, hallelujah. There's a message in that too. And walking around. And then the king looks in. Wait a minute. We put three people in there. There's a fourth man in there. Now, here's an unbeliever. And he says, and it looks like the Son of God. Wow. Say, wow, that was in the Bible. It can be in your life too. Let me tell you something. One of the ministries that we support, The Voice of the Martyrs, I don't know if you get that magazine. God, I don't know how these people stand up to the persecution they're going through. They rape them, they kill them, they torture them, they execute them. And you can see some of them with scars all over their body. Families killed in front of them. And they still stand up for Jesus. And most of them don't even have a Bible. You have 46 of them. They don't, they don't even have one. And they're willing to die for Jesus Christ. My goodness. My goodness. Throughout the word of God and throughout the, the testimony of men and women who have come to Christ, we see how they had to endure hardship. They had to endure pain and persecution and even death. But God was always there for them. Did he not say, I'll never leave you, never forsake you? Hmm? Did he not say that? It wasn't just a, pro a, a vague promise. He means it. Whatever you're going through this morning, God is there with you. God is there with you. You know what the problem is? We give up when the victory is right ahead of us. You want to keep the problem? You want to keep the issue? You want to keep whatever it is? Go ahead, keep it. I don't want it. I want to go to the victory. Don't you? That's why we can have joy in persecution. We can have joy in all kinds of things. Because God is going to bring us to the joy. Hmm? He's going to bring us to the joy. You'd be amazed if you just live the Christian life that you say you have. What God will do for you. I read this story a number of years ago about a man who worked in an automobile plant where they made parts for automobiles. He was a good mechanic, but because he was a Christian and didn't go out drinking with everybody and didn't come up with the stories about his carousing and didn't curse and swear like everybody else, they made fun of him. They harassed him. They did all kinds of things to try him, to get him to quit. He didn't quit. He kept working. He was there for years. One day, a man comes in and says, I want to talk to you. He didn't know who the man was. It was the man that owned the country, the company. He says, you know, I founded this company many years ago on honesty and integrity. He wasn't even a Christian. He says, my name is on this building. I'm ready to retire. He says, and I want someone to take over this, this whole building that thinks like me. And the man said, but I don't have any money. I can't buy the, the business. He said, I didn't ask you that. I'm, I have plenty of money. I want someone to carry my name on and my integrity and honesty in a product. You are the man. If you don't think people are watching you, they are. The world's looking for an honest person, even though they're not honest. They're looking for a truthful person, even though they don't tell the truth. Because they can't trust each other. They can't. You'd be amazed at how many people are watching you to see if you really are what you say you are. And if you really are what you say you are, you watch what happens. You're the one they're going to look for. You're the one they're going to trust. You're the one they're going to promote. It's time to get out of the closet. They've been talking about this. You can't hide from being a Christian. Either you are or you're not. Yes, there'll be some harassment. Yes, there'll be some persecution. But in the end, you will have joy. Hallelujah. You want to know what it is? Take a look at the back of the book. You're reading the Bible. And that just gives you a little taste. 
of what the rewards are. But God gives rewards here too. Hmm? To the upright. To the people who not just say it, but do it. You know your best testimony at work is? Not how many Bibles you give out. Your work. Do you do a good job? I've been in places I didn't want to be in. But I learned to do a good job. In spite of. Guess what? Some people didn't like that. But some people did. And it caused me to get all kinds of benefits. Look at Paul's resume. Do you think God was right when he picked the Apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, to be his missionary to the Roman world? Why would you pick him? You got 11 disciples, hand-picked, right? He didn't pick any one of them. Hmm? Why? They all went out and brought the gospel, but a lot of them were prejudiced. They thought you had to be Jewish. If you were a Gentile, you had to become a Jew to be a Christian. <laughs> In fact, it's the other way around. When you become a Christian, you actually become a Jew because you fulfill all the promises of the Jewish faith in God, the same God. They're stuck in gear. Here's a man who persecuted the church harshly, caused people to die, caused people to be thrown from their homes, caused people to be punished in every other way. That's the guy God picks. See, God knew something about this man that he didn't even know. Whatever he put his teeth into, he was like a pit bull. He didn't let go. He thought he was doing right. He thought these followers of the way were hurting the Jewish faith. You know what I'm saying? He thought he was right till he met Jesus on the road to Damascus, got knocked down, hmm? blinded. God picks a murderer and a person who persecutes the church to be his representative? Hmm? Why? Because God knows us. He knows what we're capable of. He knows our strengths. He knows our weaknesses. He probably knew that every one of those other guys could never do what Paul accomplished. Listen to his resume. This is just part of it. Five times... He is whipped, 39 stripes, with the bone and the metal in his back, five times. Most people didn't survive once. Five times. Three times beaten with rods, whacked across his feet, the back. One time they even stoned him to death. He got up and walked away. When would you give up? Three times he shipwrecked in the ocean. Betrayed. Robbers, tired, pain, hunger, thirst, cold, even problems with the churches that he founded in the name of Christ. Would you give up? He never did. And God knew that. When he picked him, you are going to be my representative to the Gentiles. Now, imagine telling that to an Orthodox Jew. <laughs> he was like the Hasidim. I'm going to be what? But God knew something about him and about every one of us. Hmm? If you think you can't do it, you won't do it. And if God tells you to do it, he tells you to do it because he knows you can do it. He's not going to tell you to do something that you can't do. That in the end you'll fold. Oh, hallelujah. With all the things he's given us, there is nothing we cannot do for him. Hmm? In my name, you shall what? Woo! Everybody's talking about. Every believer has power and the ability to use the name of Jesus. Let me end with this. We're going to talk about this next week, too. You are a tremendous source of God's power if you just let him take the wheel of your life. Hmm? If you're less, stop complaining about the persecution Stop complaining about the things that would hinder you and say, Lord, I love you no matter what. And I'm going to do what you want me to do. Listen to this old hymn. Sometimes on the mount where the sun shines so bright. Sometimes we're on the mountain. Everything is fine. Sometimes the mountain's on us. Hmm? 
God leads his dear children along. Sometimes in the valley, in the darkest night, God leads his dear children along. Some through the waters. Oh, my goodness. Some through the floods. We've had some floods, haven't we? Some through the fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow. God gives us a song. In the night season and all the day long. That's who God is. Let's stand this morning. I don't know everything about you, and I, I probably will never know everything about you, but God knows. Whatever you're going through this morning, I know you think you're not going to come out of it. I know you think it's going to overwhelm you. I know you think that God has forgot about you. He hasn't. God is here to remind you that you're his child, and he is not going to let anyone mess with you no matter who it is. Hmm? This morning, why don't you just make a covenant with God? We've been talking about that in a Bible study. It's a solemn agreement. Say, God, wherever you lead me, I shall go. What you tell me to do, I shall do. Hmm? Stop fighting with God. He knows what's best for you and me, even if we don't. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you, Lord, that you are a faithful God. You are the only God. You love us. And sometimes you allow these tests in our life. Not to hurt us. Not to knock us down. But to build us up. So we can go to the next level. That we can help others who are struggling as well. Help us, Lord, to not be afraid anymore of being a Christian. Let's live what we say. Let's live what we should. Let's do what is right so that others can see, whether they like it or not, that there is a way, there is a God, and that he can change lives and make us totally new creation in Christ Jesus.